JSA TV, the newsroom for tech and telecom professionals, and JSA Radio, your voice for tech and telecom on iHeartRadio. I'm Dean Perrine, and on behalf of our team here at JSA, welcome to our monthly roundtable. We are bringing together top thought leaders talking about topics important to our industry in our monthly virtual roundtable series, available right here on our JSA TV YouTube channel, as well as on JSA Radio, the only tech and telecom podcast series currently available on iHeartRadio. These monthly roundtables lead us up to our on-site CEO roundtables at our industry networking event, the Telecom Exchange. Next one up is on June 20th and 21st on Wall Street in downtown New York City. More information can be found at, at thetelecomexchange.com. Com. All right, folks, this is going to be a fun one today. Very few um, topic subjects have been as buzzy as 5G and IoT, um, which only makes sense then that we would bring together some expert panelists to talk about that very subject, and that is 5G and its impact on IoT. Um, this roundtable is brought to you on our JSA video platform, which allows our panelists to log in virtually from anywhere around the world, streaming live video feeds, care of our partners, the video collaboration managed service provider, Pinnica. So thank you very much for that, Pinnica. Um, I want to welcome our live audience here today and also those of you who are downloading on demand. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, I am honored to introduce our guest moderator, Mr. Erwin Lazar. Erwin is the Vice President and Service Director at Numertes Research. He manages research operations, develops and manages research projects, conducts and analyzes primary research, and advises numerous enterprise and vendor clients. Erwin is responsible for benchmarking the adoption and use of emerging technologies in unified communications and collaboration, covering the collaboration space as an analyst for over 15 years. Um, Erwin, thanks very much for being here today. Uh, with that, I am going to turn it over to you. If you would kindly um, introduce the, the panelists and, uh, and we'll get going. Great, thank you, Dean, and, and thank you to all of you who are joining us, as Dean mentioned, either live or on demand. I'm pleased to have a wonderful panel of, of industry luminaries around the 5G and IoT space. And so let me start with uh, quickly introducing everyone, and then I'll give them a chance to tell, tell you a little bit more about what they do and what their interest areas are around 5G and IoT. So first up is Terry McCabe, who's CTO of Mobile Enterprise at Mitel. Uh, second is Saeed Saeem Hussein, who we'll call Z, who is founder and CTO at Eris. And then Upkar Dhaliwal, who's CEO and founder of Future Wireless Technologies. So Terry, why don't you tell us a little bit about your involvement in the 5G and IoT, in the IoT space within Mitel? Sure. Um, so basically we're looking at, at the impact that 5G has on digital transformation and how IoT is going to shape the way in which employees interact with each other, the way in which businesses interact with their customers. You know, how do you use the Internet of Things the instrumented environment that we live in and will live in going forward, how does that affect the way in which communication services are, are rendered? And, you know, we're not waiting for 5G. 5G is something that we see enabling a massive growth in what is already being developed in a 4G and a pre-standards environment. So, you know, 5G, wonderful enabler, but we're not sitting back waiting for 5G to enable us to get some of these services started. Interesting. Okay. Saeed or Z? Absolutely. I agree with that comment that Terry just made. We believe that uh, 5G will just add another transport capability. But there, again, the other thing to keep in mind is that 5G has a wide range of capabilities. The low latency and the high performance will be geared to a certain set of users who may not necessarily be using it for IoT, but the 5G standard encompasses all of the low power wide area network technologies, which we believe is what's going to drive the large scale adoption of a, of a set of sensor based devices, which wouldn't happen otherwise. So it's a combination of impacts. Uh, you know, the, frankly, the speeds, the high performance of 5G 
is unlikely to be really needed by a wide variety of IoT devices, applications. Uh, it's going to be the high end, the people who really need a lot of data, a lot of low latency, et cetera. Some applications like in ad adding to the capabilities that exist for the connected car and autonomous driving markets, perhaps. But the sensor market will be driven by the slower performance, lower, uh, the, the higher latency, perhaps, um, but in a unified way where the network can adapt all of the necessary data transports uh, that 5G encompasses. So that's what we're looking at. We expect that to be a very important part of IoT in general. The concern I have is that uh, it'll take some time to get the coverage that's necessary to make 5G viable for a large class of applications that need widespread, widespread distribution and service coverage. Okay. So I'll, I'll come back to some of those topics in a second, but let me uh, let Ukar uh, in introduce himself to our audience. Yes, so uh, I'm Apkar Dhaliwal. Um, I have many interests, um, and uh, I'd like to uh, amplify what Terry and Ziv said. Um, I agree with them, um, but I would go a bit, bit more than that. Um, I think um, as we transition to this world of 2020 and beyond, where, where uh, new business models, new service models will be enabled. So really, I, I think um, as we transition from 4G, will be reaching a world where new services and new values will be uh, unleashed right from um, the networks that we built um, and the networks we are going to build. So as we transition to 5G, it's more than just about wireless. It's also about how do we transform business models. Remember, um, the, internet the rise of the internet giants really took over the revenue stream, right? from most mobile operators. Most mobile operators are seeing um, a lack of re ROI, revenue stream. So that's the challenge we have. Interesting. And so uh, some, some great topics for us to circle back on. So let's start with a, a state of 5G today. Is 5G, I, I've seen the, the pr projections of real world deployments coming in the early 2020s to now trials running today. And it seems like we've sped up the, the, the movement of 5G into production environments. Where are we today with respect to 5G? Terry, why don't you kick us off? Well, I, I think what we are seeing, you know, unfortunately there's the marketing and there's the reality as, as usual. And we all know that with 4G, we certainly in the North American market had some confusion over definitions of 4G. And I think you're going to get the same thing with 5G, unfortunately. There isn't, there isn't going to be a clean generational cutover. So we are seeing some early adoption of, of 5G for uh, residential broadband uh, supplements. So really going to that, that uh, additional capacity, additional spectrum being made available for last mile, last kilometer connectivity. Um, that's something that we'll see before 2020. And I think you know, you're already seeing announcements out of Verizon and AT&T regarding that. We're seeing some things in Japan and Korea there. But those aren't really the 5G that we're talking about. You know, we've been talking about IoT, connected devices, low latency, massive deployment. And those low power applications aren't necessarily enabled by the pre-5G 5G that we will see. So 2020 and beyond, I think that's really what we're talking about for scaled implementation. And there are going to be some very big differences between the regional rollouts. You look at 4G, 4G in Europe versus 4G in North America, very different picture. Scales of operator deployments are different and the regional coverage is different. And I think we're going to see some of that even perhaps more with 5G because as, as Upkar said earlier, um, some of the carriers out there are having a much more difficult time justifying the capex of going to a new generation of technology than others are. Um, and that's, you know, that's going to shape how quickly these things roll out. So when we say you know, the applications have to find a way to be realized, it may be 5G technology or a mashup of 5G and other technologies. We've seen some things with 4G recently around uh, the introduction of, of profiles that allow uh, increasing IoT capabilities from 4G. And that's an important stepping stone. And I think we'll see a lot of, a lot of carriers try to leverage that as a way to 
address IoT before the major investment of 5G? So, Z, let me follow up with you on a question based on what Terry said. As, as uh, you're playing in the IoT space today, are you are you limited by the, the fact that the initial rollouts are, are uh, residential focused and that the, the true full 5G uh, infrastructure to support things like IoT may be still a few years away? Or how do you how do you begin to deliver IoT solutions without necessarily being dependent on the speed of rollout of, of 5G? Oh, I think Terry has it right. I think there's a big difference between the marketing and reality of, of 5G. Uh, the standards make a difference, obviously. One of the biggest concerns that we've had, for example, and the people who have been transitioning even to 4G has been the fact that uh, unlike 2G, 3G, where the spectrum being used for those technologies around the world was very consistent, 4G was a problem. Even within the U.S., if you picked a certain radio that didn't have a certain band, you were limited by the number of uh, service operators who could provide you cap the capabilities that you need. And around the world, it became even worse. We have some large customers who are looking at international deployments who are literally saying, oh boy, I have to keep six different radios to worry about how I'm going to provide services around the world in 4G. Um, the problem that we see with 5G is not, not really the fact that technology has to evolve, but it's not driven by the IoT requirements. It's driven by the people who need faster and faster smartphone capabilities, smart response, faster approaches for downloading data for other applications other than IoT. And the fact that technologies transition relatively quickly is a big problem. Uh, I'm hoping that the low power stuff will actually have some longevity because that's where people get very concerned. When you're talking about 10, 20, 50 billion, depending on whose number you believe, devices out there, um, if you have to make a change, if you have to make a technology change after uh, even the devices that are deployed out there have served their useful life, it's a problem. And so we need to make sure that the 5G coverage is stable and that we don't move away from 4G too quickly. My anticipation is that the standards will stabilize by the end of this decade, 2020. And so IoT will really pick up steam in 5G, as Terry mentioned, I think in the next decade. Um, the estimates that I see from the ITU is that 4G LTE is supposed to be around through 2035. That's good. Uh, I'm hoping that 5G will not stop certain carriers from increasing their 4G LTE coverage because that could be a big issue for the customers who need it today. So, Ukar, you, you mentioned the, the economics, and, and obviously that's a big issue whenever you're looking at, at a technology like 5G that requires fairly significant infrastructure investments. Where are service providers looking to monetize 5G? How can they build the business cases for making right. that investment? Right, right. So, so just to carry on the thread what Z just uh, mentioned earlier and what Terry brought up. Yes, yeah, so just for the uh, audience, um, uh, I personally th see 5G as an overlay technology. Um, it will be um, a, an add-on capability. Um, and most operators right now are still trying to monetize and build out uh, using um, infrastructure and service providers that, um, that, that is cost effective. Um, they're very reluctant, right? Um, so so let's, trans let's, um, let's distinguish um, what mobile operators, ISP providers are going to provide and what, um, what new services and capabilities and new models in this world of data science and predictive anal analytics okay is going to unleash right so th so the overlay networks right uh, of um, sensory IOT okay I, I would go even beyond what Z mentioned about 30 billion I I, I see a, a world in 10 years time of a trillion devices okay the question when we get to a trillion devices if you add up how many sensor nodes you have around you is how are we going to connect right so we have a connectivity a economics thing so yes coming back to your question again yeah the operators struggling actually they're struggling and we are all we're actually taking the some benefit of that right right now if you if you saw verizon verizon's joined the unlimited bundle packet because you cannot afford not to stay in the game right so the game is poker and it's becoming really a high level poker game. Do, do service providers have a sense of where their opportunities are to monetize? I mean, looking at ARPU over the last few years, it's been relatively flat, at least in the consumer space. A lot of what you see are, at least here in the US, are providers 
chasing each other, taking their customers away, and then losing them back yeah. based on the next deal. Where, where are the opportunities for, for new revenue streams that you see? Yeah. So uh, as you saw the, the new bill on the hill, right, um, of allowing data sharing. So question again would be, um, all these players have been building up data, and some of them having been leveraging the data. The data has been going over to the internet giants. The Googles and the Facebooks have been using all that traffic, data, analytics. So the real challenge now is, can these guys, um, can the service providers, right, and and the, and and the new entrants, right? Remember, um, more and more of these operators are becoming more and more vertically integrated. They're acquiring other uh, services like entertainment and um, other kinds of value-added services. How do they leverage all the data analytics and predictions behind that? And so those will help the business models. And of course, create lots of battles between you know, the Electronic Freedom Foundation well, and... We, it didn't, right? Yeah. So, so you know, I've got a question for you a little bit uh, to build on what you, you brought up earlier about speed, and or not, not necessarily speed being the key benefit of 5G, but also some of the low latency characteristics. What are some of the kinds of things that 5G will enable in an IoT world that aren't possible today in 4G, Wi-Fi, other kinds of services that are out there? Oh, that's not a good question. Uh, I think that uh, 5G will enable that end of the application spectrum, which really needs high performance. Um, and I think some of those applications are yet to be determined. Uh, we have seen customers wanting to do video feeds from certain devices that are monitoring in either the driver of a vehicle or providing the capability of doing downloads of information at a much more rapid pace. Um, I think that 5G will also enable in certain classes of uh, automotive applications the ability to get functions that we wouldn't try to do today in 2G, 3G, or 4G because they simply aren't fast enough. I don't believe 5G will be successful in the autonomous car revolution because the performance requirements there are pretty enormous. But certainly in uh, sort of not necessarily the highest end of the self-driving car uh, solutions, but certainly that level or two down from there has been, has been defined. Uh, by the, uh, auto the autonomous car industry. That is where having some of this low latency, high data rates will allow information to be sent to the vehicles and the fleets and the trucks uh, at a rate fast enough for them to take advantage of that. Excellent. So as you think about that potential future where you might have millions or even trillions, as, as Ukar mentioned, of devices, obviously the, it probably isn't scalable to have all of those devices connecting across 5G network back to a data center is how, how do we build out that infrastructure to potentially do localized processing? Is, is that, where does that happen in a, in a 5G environment? Well, that's a darn good question. If I might just address one comment, which I think is very important. Remote processing, what Cisco likes to call fog computing and, and there are other terms associated with that, are going to be key. We have to avoid creating haystacks of data. While I absolutely agree that data analytics are, are a vital to these applications, we are, have a tendency to create what I call, somebody else actually termed this coin, I love it, data museums. And we have to avoid that. We need to have relevancy. The data has to arrive in a timely manner for the business purpose for that application to be fulfilled. And unless we can do that in a, in a good way and make sure that the data is sent regardless of the transport of the information that is being sent, uh, unless we can make sure that what we send is relevant to the application, we're in trouble. And I think that the fog computing requirements that, that will be set, not necessarily at the sensors, because they may be very dumb, or the trillions of sensors that will be out there, but certainly at the, at the various gateways and other network elements along the way, to provide that level of I hate to use the word filtering, but I'd rather say remote processing of that information that is vital to the applications. Is that an opportunity, I think, for service providers to, to get into that space where they may have to have a little more intelligence in versus just carrying bits? Absolutely. Well, I, I think, okay, so I'll, I'll okay, I'll, I'll perhaps be a little argumentative here and, and question whether, whether the service providers are in a position to do some of these things. It, realistically speaking, the, the DNA of the organization is a critical factor. And we're talking here about, we're he, talking here about a very fundamentally different approach towards not just building a network, but managing facilities. In principle, 
you, a service provider ought to be able to create those, um, let's say, uh, shared resources, these, these fog data centers at the network edge. Um, but there are all these issues of multi-tenancy and data sovereignty that are going to be very, very difficult to manage. And if you look at who's done the best job of cracking those problems to date, that is new disruptive players. It's folks come, you know, it's Amazon. Who would have thought Amazon would have any criteria or any, any qualification in that space, but they have done a, a tremendous job. So, uh, you know, the, the idea that connected car is going to be, if you pardon the, the expression, driven by the carrier community and carrier technologies, I'm uh, not so sure. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I agree. So just taking on those steps or, or what Z mentioned and Terry, and just to keep it uh, going, keep the flow going yet, don't get argumentative yet. Um, I, I agree. Um, so I'm, I'm busy evolved in network transformation, bringing software defined networking to the mobile edge. So how do we bring, how do we, so we, we haven't been able to be successful SDR. We haven't been able to evolve the radio, but what we have been successful is, is transforming the, the data networks. So moving the software defined networking right to the mobile edge. Now the challenge we have, right, like Terry's mentioned, is once we've got these connected car, which we've been trying to do for the last 15 years, and to just bring a simple model of, in, in the connected car of active vehicle safety, we will have active vehicle safety in the next few years. There's no, the DOT is on that road. So as we have the active vehicle safety, what do we do with a car that's connected? Do we put storage in there? Do we put local computing? How much we put it in there, right? And then once we put it in there, how, how, are, we gonna, how are we going to realize the, the connectivity around it? So when the car is parked, okay, what do we do with a car parked? Can we use a parked car as a network densification model? So those are the, some of the things that I'm busy involved in is network transformation using different business models and different players that have been sitting around for the last five or 10, 20 years. So does that pretend that 5G isn't necessarily the, the requirement, but there could be evolution of, of exactly. networking among connected devices? Exactly. Remember I said overlay, remember? Overlay. Right. Right, so we, we, the operators want to leverage. Um, remember also that um, as we transformation into this uh, 4G, there was consolidation on equipment, equipment manufacturers. So they have very little wiggle room, right, on breaking down pricing. So they're struggling trying to get their, their revenue and their ROIs together. So how can they leverage existing 4G uh, networks uh, for even longer longevity. Le le so, let me ask you another question, just sort of honing in again on the economics and business case around 5G. Are you starting to see uh, businesses looking at the kinds of services that can be delivered in a, in a, in a more connected world? Uh, we talked quite a bit about connected cars, but uh, right. do, do businesses outside of the, the large automakers see any value in 5G? Are they starting to, to look at it as more than just uh, higher speed connectivity. Correct. So, uh, so some of them, so it's all about bringing new service and business models. Remember, it's about um, um, risk reduction and risk management, right? So how can these guys use um, services of um, data and video, right? Okay. In an economic way, right? To reduce their risk or reduce their predictive. And so there's more and more needs to having um, better services. Anyone else um, have any comment about what they're seeing in terms of the kinds of services that are, are being enabled by 5G? Um, Z here. Uh, I think that uh, that's a bit early at this stage yet. Uh, I have yet to see a single 5G capable radio that I would say could be used in an IoT application today. And I don't anticipate that for a number of years. I mean, people are still wrapping their heads around LTE, 4G radios, availability, pricing for large-scale deployments. I, I think what one, you know, we're still seeing interesting evolutionary stages here with, with LTE. If you look at some of the, the 
the recent rate plan announcements and and network let's say updates around um, machine profile for LTE where you're now seeing a dramatic change in the cost of a subscription for a, a, a sensor device now it's it's dramatic when you compare it to what a traditional consumer ARPU is it's still a long way from what it needs if you're going to have a trillion devices out there so we've taken a step on the path but there are many more steps to come I'll take an example um, if you look at logistical tracking for the last number of years you have solutions that at the level of tracking a, perhaps a shipment container on a global basis there's a there's a business case for that um, but you're not going to track an individual box or parcel with with real-time data unless it's a very high value object well as the cost comes down then the range of things which you can start to track you know today you go on to UPS and you can see where your parcel is you can imagine and it's becoming reality that you will be able to track not just where it is but its environmental conditions if you're shipping um, medical materials you'll have the ability to see what its historical lifetime shipment condition was if you're shipping food or perishables you the the, the cost effectiveness of tracking through the entire lifetime of that object becomes practical and that's where the trillion you know when you get to the point where you have disposable sensors embedded in in objects that you're that you're transporting through the world that's when we've really reached the point where where it's transformational but there's many steps on the path it doesn't mean you have to wait until you have you reach those economics before you can start to insert this in high value transactions and tracking the drone that is delivering these packages Absolutely. Well, correct. So, as uh, Terry was saying, is um, transformation. And let me throw another buzzword in here, guys. Network slicing, right? So we will see. We, I, I'm busy involved in, as Terry knows, I'm busy involved in uh, enabling neutral venue hosting. So as we transform the networks to the mobile edge, we will be transforming and, and providing network slicing on, on different services and running on top of it so a little so those will those will be really but so I think we'll see those subtle changes in the network right um, and those will be the indicators that 5G is arriving right uh, rather than uh, seeing a massive micro radio head in my cell phone right right uh, at 38 gigs right um, we're we, we, we're still far away for when we're going to light up those street lamp posts, right, with millimeter wave radio heads, as an example. So we're winding down. We've got a, a couple of minutes left. Uh, one last question to just kind of put out to everybody. Um, there's a lot of different variances of 4G and the uh, high cost of having to have different kinds of radios that speak on the Verizon network and the AT&T network and global networks and so on. Will 5G solve that? Will we have a single global universal 5G standard? Whoever would like to take that one. I think we'll have we'll have a standard, but we won't have we won't have consistent availability of spectrum. We're already seeing it. Fragmentation of spectrum allocations. Regulators just can't solve that problem, and I don't see it. I don't see it happening with 5G. Correct, correct. We we uh, so I'm an RF guy. It doesn't tell you, but I am. So uh, uh, my holy grail has always been SDR. So so how do we use spectrum? How do we do what the military guys have been doing? That's dynamic spectrum allocation, and when, when we saw, we've seen signs of that. We've seen spectrum access managers coming online. We've seen new spectrums in 3.5 gigs and and 5 gigs being uh, made available, lightly using reusing spectrums that are not occupied, right? And so, the challenge we have again is um, how we're going to bundle these spectrum slots together, right? And make um, make services out of them. Well, with that, we'll we'll have to wrap up due to time. I really would like to thank all of you for uh, for joining us today, as well as our distinguished thank panel. You. And Dean, uh, let me turn it up over to you for some closing comments. Thank you. 
You bet. Thank you, Erwin, for moderating today. And thank you, panelists. You were all uh, exceedingly insightful. Frankly, I thought maybe we should just uh, order some lunch and keep this thing going all afternoon. I, I feel like we uh, just barely scraped the surface. I can't thank you enough for, uh, for joining us today. Also, thank you to our audience for joining us. If you would like to see this and our other monthly virtual roundtables on demand, plus the calendar for upcoming roundtables, both virtually and at Telecom Exchange, check out jamiescotto.com and the Telecom Exchange Com. If you'd like your C-Level to be featured here next, email us at pr at jamiescotto.com. Thanks again, everyone, for tuning in to JSA TV, the newsroom for tech and telecom professionals, and JSA Radio, your voice for tech and telecom on iHeartRadio. We will see you soon.